Welcome, everyone, <coughs> to another Friday Forum. Um, and to the, our unusual weather. Amazing. All right, so let me uh, give you some formal background for Juan. I'll say a few words on top of that. Uh, Juan was born in Barcelona, Spain. Who knew? Some people don't know because they, they think that I was born in Madrid. A lot of people think that I was born in Madrid. Well, you're not from Texas. That would be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Fernando <laughs> thinks that because I'm a Real Madrid fan. He, I mean, was, <laughs> he was born in Barcelona and uh, got his professional degree uh, from Escuela Tecnica Superior de Arquitectura de Madrid. That's mm -hmm. um, A Fulbright scholarship was also here. He finished his post-professional master's at Yale where he uh, cemented nice work there, a lifelong interest in ancient culture. One is the founding principal of Miro Rivera Architects. His firm has been recognized for uh, design excellence with more than 100 design awards, including the Tex Texas Firm Achievement Award from the TSA. In 2018, his firm was recognized by Arch Daly as one of the world's best architects, one of the only 17 firms selected from the U.S. and Canada. Juan is also a professor at the School of Architecture here. He's taught for more than 20 years, so he's just starting. <laughs> um, he's been awarded numerous teaching awards, among them the Distinguished Teaching Professor Award by the ACSA and the Region's Outstanding Teaching Award by UT System. In 2011, he was elected to the College of Fellows, so he's FAIA. Um, Juan was also our, uh, one of our associate deans for how many years? Did you four years. Four. Year? Four, 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 years. four years. That's what I thought. Felt like four years. Yeah. Um, and those of you who have been around Juan um, or taken his classes uh, have experienced his incredible depth of knowledge, his passion for his subject matter, his complete, I think, contemporaneity. Uh, which he combines with this love of sort of ancient culture. But I think today's lecture is about not ancient culture in any stretch. More so right? than you think. Maybe Bach and Burn. <laughs> so uh, I was blown away when I saw the title, and I'm sure we all can't wait to hear uh, Juan's lecture. Thank you for doing this. Okay, thank you. Well, th th thank you for the invitation, Michael. I mean, it's been great to come here over the years. I think that you and Kevin and Diora have maintained the, the excitement of, of coming here. Danilo is in Paris and he told me, he wrote to me and he said, oh Juan, I would love to be there. Uh, is your first talk at the center and, mm -hmm. and I, I'm sorry to miss it. I said, hey Danilo, I've been, I've been here before. And then I went back, I didn't remember how many times, but I went back to a poster I have in my office. The first time I think is this yeah. one in 2002 at the center, you can mm -hmm. see already, circles were there but uh, and, the, and this was more about public space this one was mainly talking about defending the need for public space in in cities it was uh, based on that subject this one and just just to kind of surprise michael oh. i like variation of topics this one was uh, uh, four years later i think and it was sustainability of the art of common sense it was also an interesting subject when you think about public space sustainability and then the last one I did, I think that there was another one. I couldn't find it. Maybe this, these are the only three. I thought for some reason, I thought there was a fourth one. Are dense cities really better? So this is uh, more recent. So it's uh, urban uh, design, thinking about the city. So this one, just to surprise Michael, I decided to talk about social media. And actually, he doesn't know, but he's the one who prompted this, uh, I, this, this, the notion of this uh, talk. When we met at the retreat this uh, summer, I, w I just came from a sabbatical. I had been, for the first time in more than 20 years, I was for a year without teaching. So it was a very unusual thing for those of us who right? <laughs> have been doing it for a long time because it was a whole year without teaching for the first time since 1996. So, so Michael asked me in the, in the retreat, so what have you been doing? And, and, and I said, well, we finished a book of the work of our firm. And, and I started an Instagram account. And Michael said, what? Is that a good thing? <laughs> <laughs> Is that what he said? You don't probably don't remember that. Okay. So, but that's what you said. Is that a good thing? 
And, and I think that uh, in a way it has been an interesting thing for me too because I belong to the world that Michael is part of when he asked that question. So seven months ago, century, well, you know, seven, seven months ago, I didn't know, and no, nine months ago, I didn't know anything about social media from the point of view, never had a Twitter, Facebook, Instagram account. Someone in my firm does all that in, in, in kind of without our involvement. So with my, my involvement or my partner, Miguel. So, uh, so I, I belong to, you know, in a way to the in-between people that think of social media as a monumental waste of time, which is very much how it can be perceived. It can be very much a, a, a black hole where, like Michael was saying, can take over your life, right? right. But the question, obviously, the title of my talk is a rhetorical question. A lot of people have already waiting in the, in the definitely the potential for social media to do good things for uh, many reasons. And this is interesting. When this lecture was announced, I got an email from Paloma Diaz. She's the scholarly programs director at LILAS. And Paloma wrote to me and she said, Juan, I just gave a lecture three days ago about this very same topic. And, and she sent me the link. It was at the University of Notre Dame. He, she couldn't be here today because she's also lecturing in New Orleans today. But she, in, the, in, the, in, in her lecture, this is the kind of excerpt of, from, from the announcement of her lecture that social media indeed is becoming a critical communication tool for scholars, public intellectuals, journalists, pol uh, politicians, and more. So it is clear that there's a tool that we cannot ignore. Uh, and I think that the, the problem is that it can be at the extremes, it could be like everything. It could be very bad if it's not used properly or it can be addictive. You know, that's very clearly a problem also, but it definitely can help. And I think that what I, what I wanted to is to just give a sense of how I arrived to this kind of uh, uh, use of social media in the way and the way I'm looking at it. So. First, I wanted to look at the description of what research is considered, you know, differently in different places, but just going back to the dictionary, a detailed study of a subject, especially in order to discover new information or research a new understanding. And I think that this is at the core of what we are as a, as a university, as a teaching institution, in the sense that uh, we call ourselves our research university, UT, of course. And when you think about what we are here for, uh, as, a, as a university, I think that basically our, our, our goals are, if you reduce it to the very simple, is like we share what we know as, uh, and with our faculty, I mean, with our colleagues, with our students, with, our, uh, with the staff. That's part of the learning, the, the, the teaching, the, the learning that happens at the university. And the other uh, responsibility that we have is to produce new knowledge and new ideas, right? So uh, as uh, as an institution, that's one of the things that we, we do as a research institution. So in that regard, I think that that's where I think that social media can play, can play a role in the communication of new ideas and in ways to, to create uh, a new knowledge. How to do it is not necessarily a very easy thing. But when you think about, for example, the role of practicing architects, I'm a practicing architect. Most people think of me that way. And uh, I don't mind, that's, that's main, my main focus. Uh, and going to Michael, you know, question, we, we did a, a book of our work. Our work is one of the ways that uh, as a professional architect, we, we play that role of creating new knowledge and you know, promoting new ideas. A lot of people don't think that a practicing architect should be necessarily involved in academia in the way sometimes we are, and in the sense that it feels like why are you doing here? You're a practicing architect. You should be doing practicing architecture. You know, you are not in the world of the, of the research. I think that it will be a sad day when practices architects are not involved in, 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 in teaching in the schools of architecture. But that's a subject for another, uh, another lecture. And maybe we should do it. So in addition to being a practicing architect, I am a very curious person. Like Michael said, I'm very interested in ancient cultures. I'm very fascinated with pre-Columbian architecture in particular. And I have been for a long time. And I know that this confuses a lot of people. Sometimes even colleagues of mine is like, why, why in the world are you interested in these things? <laughs> you know, sometimes they get a lot of, a lot of kind of uh, surprise. And, and I have tried to use the normal channels to spread uh, ideas about how I see these things. So for example, in, in the case of Teotihuacan, I have published 
what is more like the typical scholarly uh, uh, publications where you promote, but sorry, you explain your new interpretations of, of a place. So this has a route that is very common in academia. You just publish a paper, it's a peer review, you review it, you, you, know, you publish it, and the ideas get diffused that way, disseminate that way. And it could be, you know, for example, promoting a, a, the idea of how to preserve Teotihuacan. So it's more of the preservation. It could be a new interpretation of the iconography of Teotihuacan, something that I've been interested in for years. And then I discovered that there's a, a, another way to promote ideas that can be a little, a little faster, you know. And this is one of the things that media, social media. So when we think about the academic world, it feels like it's very ri rigid in terms of like what is considered the official channels to be uh, promoted for full professor, promoted for associate professor. It looks like there's a certain kind of uh, ways of measuring how, how you promote uh, or your, your own work and thinking. And, and it's still very hard for universities to understand what's the role of uh, opinion pieces, pieces like uh, uh, op-eds and things like that that are not necessarily uh, peer review in the way that the journals uh, uh, for different disciplines do it. So this is, for example, one that I wrote about city and the growth of the city of Austin. You know, years later, you still read it. It feels very valid, very much like uh, the issues that we're dealing with today. And it can serve. And I know that it has influenced people at the city hall in terms of the way they think about how the, the, the code needs to be uh, um, written. And then I have also written the academic version of some of the ideas in those op-eds. But it takes a different effort and different time. So I, and I have collaborated with this case with a colleague from Spain to give it more like the academic version of that uh, idea, introducing the concept of the landscape city. And, and, and going back to the um, media use, I have learned that there's, there's a, uh, an effective way to promote ideas related to also the work that we do in studios. For example, I have worked for several years on Brackenridge and I use the, the, the op-ed pieces to put pressure on the university to try to understand the, the, the challenge that they have in front of them. So I wrote one uh, uh, about the Brackenridge to, to try to remind the university the responsibility they have with that track of land. Then I wrote another one together with my dear colleague Jake here and we, we joined forces to try to get the university from, uh, uh, sorry, from they get the legislature from preventing the legislature from taking the, 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 the Brackenridge track from the uh, university. And this is unbelievable. All these things happen. You need to move very quickly. You cannot do a, a, a peer review paper. <laughs> you know, so we have to say, hey, Jake, we need to write this in a week. You know, can we do it? Let's do it. So I think that there's another way to promote ideas and to promote ways of seeing uh, the issues that are in front of us that we need to be very agile and we need to be able to respond uh, immediately. And, and I think that's one of the things that media and potentially social media can do. And people are using it very effectively, the wrong way, the good way. And this is one of the things that started to, to happen more clearly for me. Uh, I, I, you know, promoting other ideas, for example, with Fernando, we wrote a piece that felt like it was very relevant after all the disasters, that natural disasters that happened uh, 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 two years ago, uh, we wrote a piece that he was basically promoting a very clear idea, how the reconnection with nature should be the kind of worldwide agreement. And I talk about global warming, talk about, but it's like putting it in the context of the Paris Agreement and how the United States is a step away, away from it. So it's very, it's very connected to the politics of the day. Another idea with uh, uh, Jun Feng, another colleague from the, from the school about transportation. So we have an idea, I, I wanted to put it out there, how the public transportation systems of American cities need to learn from Uber and Lyft in ways to provide better service. And that's an idea that gets out there. And the good thing about this is that once you, for example, this one in the, in the, in the conversation, what is good about this, uh, um, let me... What is good about this, for example, media outlets like the conversation is that this gets published in the conversation and automatically can be picked up by uh, newspapers all over the country. So this, 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 uh, this uh, piece uh, uh, on transportation was picked up by, I don't know, 20, 30 newspapers all across this, the country. And, and it has an immediate impact as an idea. You get a lot of the debate in the, in the social media from the point of view of people retweeting and, and, and Facebook and how the conversation takes a different life on its own. So 
Then he gets, you know, so all these are topics somewhat related to our discipline. So at some point, you know, he got, he got to the point that uh, during, the, during, the, during the campaign for the two, 2016 campaign, I wrote a piece like so many people in a way I felt like uh, uh, Donald Trump's campaign was very hard to not feel like you need to get involved in some way or another. So I, you know, this is before like, I wrote this of a year before he was elected. And it was really an attempt to try to put my sense of what was happening and not try to make a piece about Trump, but try to make the piece about how the enduring appeal of Trump was very connected to, at least in my opinion, to the Declaration of Independence. Obviously, very tricky subject, and you know that you're exposing yourself to a lot of uh, backlash in terms of people reacting. But I mean, I read it today, it just feels like perfectly applicable to what the situation we're in right now. And, and it, 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 obviously, for example, this is a, a publication that is only digital, the Texas Tribune. And I sent it to the New York Times first. The, 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 the Sunday Magazine uh, editor wrote to me, he's like, we like the piece very much, very well, 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 but it just doesn't fit our... So that's okay. You just go into another publication. And I did it here with the Texas Tribune. I was very happy that it was very uh, uh, promoted you know, by the, by the uh, editor as well. And then I wrote another one, and, and this one takes it into a very relevant topic that is very much related to uh, issues that we are discussing now, diversity. And, and you understand when you get into this type of, uh, I invited Ted Gordon, that is the, the Vice Provost for Diversity, to join me on this. I just felt I had to say a lot of the things that are, are I think, not known. And this is part of being curious. I've been reading a lot about these things, and all of a sudden, you have to become somewhat expert enough to be able to say things that you know that uh, are, are well researched. So these pieces, even if they're opinion pieces, you need to spend a lot of time doing the research to basically make the claims that you're making. So this one was, was picked up, was published in the Boston Globe, Chicago Tribune, uh, Los Angeles uh, uh, Times, uh, Seattle, uh, Houston Chronicle. It was published all over, uh, all over the world. I mean, sorry, all over the United States. And, and the conversation has a very interesting way of doing the analytics of how quickly this is being spread in terms of the, the way people uh, uh, get to it. For example, I haven't checked, but this, this article was apparently uh, retweeted by someone that he, he made it like a million. They have a way of measuring the journalistic impact of, of this. And I don't, I'm not familiar. I didn't sign up for this muck rack. Maybe you know that muck rack no. is... It measures these things, but you need to join. So if you join, they tell you who was the one who retweeted your, your publication. But it was, it was like a million point, point seven because apparently this person retweeted and it had a very big impact in terms of the, I don't know how they do it. What is it? Amazing. Yeah. So, so they measure all this, right? So and in this case, for example, the conversation, it gets published in all these newspapers just because the conversation makes it available for free. And all of a sudden, the ideas get out there much faster. And I think it's a way to say, okay, these things I think are important. Most people don't know the role that American universities play in white supremacism, the way the American professors were the ones that influenced Donald, I mean, Adolf Hitler, and how Adolf Hitler was very much considered American uh, professors, their, their guide. And the, one of them wrote a book that he considered his Bible and how he, they saw, Nazi Germany saw the United States as the place where they were implementing policies that they wanted to take you know, to Germany and how they apply them in ways that were very extreme. And now we associate only with them, but we forget about what, how everything started here in the US. And this is a way of saying, hey, remember this happened. So there's a way to promote this in ways that people, even people that were very educated here in the US, they have no idea that this was really true. So when you put this out there, you need to know for sure that you know what you're saying, because you're basically putting something that it can have a lot of Repercussions. So there were more than a hundred comments on this piece. This uh, isn't it? Yeah, and and more than a hundred. And this this was very very uh, very uh, uh, well documented. More than a hundred comments, and not a single comment was basically saying what you're saying is not true or what you're saying is wrong. No, it was more about the debate of this, but basically saying this happened. It can happen again. There are a lot, there's a role that universities play. That's why I think the universities need to play a role now to balance that damage that it was created, and so. This is, this, is, this is just to give a sense of how I made maybe my way into media, social media, 
in, in a funny way because it was not because of I had the accounts already. I never, as I said, I had never had a Twitter account, Facebook account, but this is already making me feel like, okay, who, who is doing, who's promoting this in terms of Facebook conversations, uh, tweets and retweets, retweets. So I became more familiar with this. Then I took the sabbatical and uh, the sabbatical uh, and the uh, uh, Google photo was a big change in my life. <laughs> Good. You know, I don't know how you, you guys organize your photographs, but my, my photographs were total chaos. I didn't know how to organize anything that I had and, until my daughter taught me, hey, you have Google Photos. My daughter, 16 years old, was, was telling me, or 15, she, she was telling me, oh, you have to do it this way. And all of a sudden, I felt like my, my life changed in terms of how I could see that world of images that were floating totally under control, I mean, out of control. And, and then I, I had a little more time. You know, I still was, I mean, my sabbatical was not playing golf. I was working normal, you know. I mean, I was just working normal, but I was not working like crazy when you have the du double life that we have as uh, professors and, and, and practicing architects. So the, the, my, my family, my, my wife, Rosa, noticed that I, because of Google photo, I was starting to organize my, my photos and I had a good collection of, uh, of circles. I, know, I like circles and I have lectured about circles before. And then my wife said, you need to start an Instagram account. And I said, oh really, how do you do that? What is, you know, what is exactly that? How do you, and so my daughter and my son taught me everything about how to start an account how to, what, what, I didn't know what a hashtag was, you know. I still am marvel at the fact that how people can find out about other people's Instagram. So I started, and I started basically based on this very broad and not clear sense of what I was going. It was very much about, okay, I'm going to just basically organize my collection in a way that it can be now seen by other people. And, and uh, I did it with this kind of very kind of, open sense that it could be very good to, to give me a place to investigate a lot of multiple things. So it's called In Full Circle, and, and, and they told me, you need to write something at the beginning about what it is that your account is about. And I just say, very simple. I say, I like circles. <laughs> as a designer, as a researcher, and my daily die, life, these are the sum of the, the circles that I have come across. And so that's how I started. So the first, the first, uh, 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 so, and this is, this is what I was going to say when I, uh, when, I, when I said that I didn't know where I was going. I like this quote from a, a guy that really knew what research was, that it says, basic research is what I'm doing when I don't know what I'm doing. And, and in a way, it's a little extreme. Obviously, he probably was not really true, but this is very much like what we say in, in studios, right? When you're investigating a project, hey, it's okay not to know where you're going. Just keep going. You know, do it. Keep going. So that's exactly how it started, with no pressure. And these are the first three that I put. I put three, the, uh, I realized, for example, that Instagram is the structure around three. So I, I'm very much about, I like to compare. I think that comparing is one of the best ways to learn from the point of view of comparing uh, how people think about similar uh, situations in different settings. So the comparison is always uh, something that I have used in my own thinking and in my own uh, Research, for example, for Teotihuacan, one of the things that I realized people in Mesoamerican studies, they don't compare with other cultures. They don't compare with other places. So they are very focused. And this is one of the problems in academia. We tend to be very narrow. And if you are not an expert, you're not supposed to write about something. And I always say, look, yeah, I can. I mean, all the things that I'm talking, I'm not an expert in constitutional law, but I can still talk about the Declaration of Independence. I just need to inform, me, inform myself to the point that I can do it with certain ability. But you don't, you cannot be, always excluded because you are not the ultimate expert in every subject because we are generalists as architects we need to know a lot about a lot of things but we have the the right to have opinions beyond architecture this is something that i want to kind of emphasize to students as well at the same time you can be very focused in what you're doing so it doesn't mean that one thing is 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 is, is close in the other so for example, because my, my son told me, no, it comes in, in, in groups of three. I said, oh, really? See, this is, Michael, something that you know. So the, the Instagram comes in, in, in three images at a time. So I, I started to organize the, the collection in ways that I was able to say, okay, I'm going to put this one on the right. It's the first photograph that I took with my phone that I had archived through my phone. So these are all photos that I take with my iPhone. 
for the for the most part. I'm invited. I mean, I people now send me circles and I tie them in themes in ways that is different. But for example, these three first uh, ones were drawings that I had seen that I think were fantastic, and I just put them. So the thing that I and then the next one I, I'll tell you in a second. You know what it was about because I wanted to go to the actual page to explain how it works in terms of uh, the the way I see this evolving because it has evolved in a way that I think is, is, is making me see this a little different now. So when you see the, the page now, so you go to the beginning, what it, what it forced me to do when you have this collection in your, in your computer is a little different than when you put it out there. So when you put it out there, the first thing that I realized, I need to be very precise about what I'm seeing. So I need to give very clear credit to who did this drawing, when, how, and when that I when I took the picture, how big it is, the circle, how big is this thing. So I, I put myself into that kind of requirement. I know that the, and I'll, I'm very much a believer of visual communication, visual uh, imagery as a way to tell stories. But I think that Instagram can be very much about just the image, and people like the image, and that's it. I like the idea of knowing what I'm looking at. So this is in a way forcing me to. If you're curious about something, learn what, what is that you're seeing. So in a way, this is something that I try to do since the first post in terms of like trying to understand exactly what I'm seeing and trying to document it. And for example, I was starting to, to put also things that I felt like can help me promote certain ideas or certain agendas that are very different in, in, in the kind of nature of them, of the, of the, of the uh, specific pursuit. For example, this is a, a photo of a building my father did in Spain, and uh, it's a skylight, but it's, it's starting to kind of describe some of the things of how it happened. I was in architecture school when this was built. It had a lot of influence because he used rebars to build this, and I used rebars after that to, to do all the projects. And uh, it started to also uh, show specific things about this building that people may not know. And, and so, for example, I, and actually what I like about it also is that I could, I could combine it with my own projects. For example, this is a building that we did. It had an interesting investigation of how domes were built in India. So this is a dome that is built just with slabs of stone stacked one on top of each other, three inches thick stab, uh, slabs of marble. And uh, all the places that I visit, for example, this is a wonderful monastery in, in, in Chile that has a skylight. It was designed by the friars that were architects that lived in the, in the, in the, in the uh, monastery. What I didn't know at the time is how to do swipes. So I didn't know how to add more images, you know, the notion that you can put other things until my son and my daughter say, hey, you can put other things. I say, okay, that's good. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to start doing it. At the beginning, I didn't want to do it. But it was, it was very important for me to have the sense that I could start organizing things by theme. So this is a way architects bring light into the building, done in a very different way. But this is the kind of theme of this one. Here, this is a sculptures, for example, that I have seen recently that are showing how there's a commonality in, te in terms of how they use the circle. This, some of them may be more um, kind of less less deep in terms of the topic that they bring up. For example, this is a construction site, a project that we were doing and the construction is completely covered now. This is a wall, a photo of my son in Berlin that he sent me and I, I liked it. This is a photo I took in Monterey of a bridge. Little things like, for example, this happened to be three museums that I visited that all these three paintings were done in 1963. So I just documented them. And then it started to get into uh, kind of what is the next uh, area that I'm going to explore. For example, I was looking at concentric arrangements of circles. And I studied something that I had looked more in depth in, in the past, which is, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar. I don't know if this can be made bigger, but you can see the circle here. And I don't know how, how many of you have uh, uh, um, heard of uh, Ramon, Raymond Yule. Yule it was a philosopher from Mallorca from the 12th century. And this started to force me to kind of really learn carefully because I knew a little bit about this, this guy's work, but I didn't know enough to write a short paper. So I see this as a little short paper that explains what this image is. So he, he wrote this book in the 12th century. So, uh, and this guy was trying to really use visual 
imagery to try to understand the world. He's, he's considered the father of modern computation. He was a very big influence in Giordano Bruno and Leib, uh, Leibniz. And, and he was uh, basically trying to, he had the theory that you can, you can derive all knowledge by the combination of certain truths. So this book, in mind, this book published at that time had a knot there and these circles could be rotated. And it had a lot of influence in the theater of memory of Giordano Bruno that basically he was burned for. This is also something that I'm very interested. These religious figures that are very, he thought that this was a way to, to convert infidels as well using imagery because they couldn't read. So, you know, it forces you to start thinking about how these really work and how visual imagery was used already by people back then and how it could be uh, interpreted in ways that it opened the door for computation. Basically, he thought, if you do any, any subject, you, you, you devise the eight undisputed truths, and then you start having other uh, assumptions, other relationships, you can combine all those three in very complicated ways. And this Giordano Bruno took it to a huge size, basically saying that everything can be devised of, out of a logical process. And it was perceived to be too radical for the, for the church, and he was burned alive, as you may know. But this is the influence. He was still on the good side of the church, even if he was you know, doing things that sometimes it felt a little hard to understand for the church. So it just started to bring me a little more in depth into the subject. For example, this is the same building that my father did that is very, very, uh, you know, a landmark building. So it's, it's, it's actually the only landmark, the only building in Spain that was declared a national landmark when the architects were still alive. But a lot of people think of this building as a building. The partner of, of my father was Fernando Higueras. He was uh, an, an architect that has a very, had a very, flamb both of them are not, not anymore with us. And, and but Fernando Higueras, my partner, my father's partner was, a totally crazy character, you know, very flamboyant, very controversial. He insulted everybody. He was very kind of difficult to deal with. And so, but a lot of people associate the work uh, with Fernando Guerra because my father was very calm, very, very quiet. So I'm using, even if this building has the, both names inscribed in the concrete at the, at the entrance, a lot of publications keep saying the building by Fernando Guerra. So I'm using this in a way to say, okay, if I can contribute to spread the word that is actually a collaboration between Fernando Guerras and my father, it will be make me feel good. And if I, you know how, how this is going on, especially with the exhibit that now, Fernando Guerras had a major exhibit now in Spain. I'm, I'm running yeah. out of time. Oh, okay. I thought it was a sign. No, no. So, so you write this and for example, this is a circular building that they did. I didn't know how to do swipes yet, so I didn't put swipes so I can show images of this building. It's fantastic. There are a lot of movies that have been shot here. It's an amazing movie. I mean, an amazing building, but it's very much counter all the kind of, the, the academia in Spain had seen the rational approach to architecture as the guiding principle for most architects in Spain. So they were outsiders. They were doing organic architecture. And they were basically not in the spotlight because of that. And now all of a sudden they're rediscovering that. But I'm trying to make sure that they rediscover that there was a, you know, this collaboration really happening. This is another building I visited. You go into Spain and all of a sudden you see these kind of amazing jewels that are completely unknown. This is a town of 179 people that has this church that it will be in the history book of almost any other place. If you look at the inside of this church that I had never heard of, it has 11 sides. I mean, how, how many things you have that has, you know, 11? And then you try to understand why. So you look at the plan and I give a description of where the geometry comes. Again, I still don't know how to do swipes. The next one will have swipes to explain how the geometry of the, because there's no transept, so how the nave becomes the altar and how the geometry was resolved in a beautiful way. So this is, this is just my curiosity, how I look at it and I like to understand how radial patterns can be defining how you organize a building. For example, going back to the one of my father, I'm going to jump back and forth, but I wanna show you the, a little bit the agenda that I was trying to say. Because of this, so for example, this is the one that is in the, in the, in the, in the poster. This is a drawing my father did in, uh, 50 years ago, almost, you know, when, when, uh, before I was born, uh, no, so it was more than 50, 70 years ago, because uh, it was in 1960. So he was just out of school. And, and this is another piece of new knowledge, new research. This is a true piece of that, because 
When my father died, there was a, an event that took place at the School of Architecture. I was lucky enough to be part of because my, I was traveling in Spain with my students. And uh, an architect from Barcelona that was a, a partner of my father in the early years uh, came to the event. You know, it was an homage to my father. And he showed a project uh, of a house that I had never seen. And he talked about how my father was interested in circular shapes early on in his career. Because a lot of people think Fernando Gueras is a circle. He likes circles. So probably he's the one who came up with that concept because of this relationship that my father had for Fernando Gueras. So I'm using this to promote that my father was very interested in this geometry early on. But what I was fascinated is that when Emilio Donato sent me the information, he sent me three pages of a 17-page letter that my father wrote to him where this drawing was made. So, and this is when I learned how to do sweeps. So, so swipes, sorry. So this is, this, is, this is the other inclusion. So this is the, the elevation of the house right below it. And this is where he drew it. He drew it in the letter itself. So it was 17 pages telling him all the things, how, the, how things were going on. And so he wrote this letter and he said, by the way, this is how we can do the house. And he drew the house there. So you can see the second floor, the first floor, the elevation. And what he's telling in the letter, I basically asked the architect, the architect sent this to me, he's 85 years old now, and he has this letter and he's nowhere else. It hasn't never been published. And I say, please send me the entire letter because I want to see what else, because he, sh he drew three other projects in the letter, just directly there. And, uh, and all of a sudden this gets posted and I get all this connection with the University of Barcelona, the library of the three universities in Barcelona, because I'm putting here the whole story because this architect tells me the story. He says, we had started an office. Your father was already in a lot of trouble because he had had the first daughter, my sister, my oldest sister was born. So he was working in another office in the morning and in the afternoon, they were trying to run their own office. So this, the architect that sent me this said, I, my father was in Ibiza, in the, in the island, in the, in the Balear Islands. And so I went there looking for work because my father was there. So I called your father and I told him, hey, we have a potential job. There's a lot here with the slope. It's for this Swiss couple. Why don't you think about something? And so my father, and they would send a letter with information. And my father would say, okay, what about this? So uh, he would he would write the pro he would draw the project he would he would draw the project and send it to him. So this is the the project that the architect in his partner in Ibiza was telling him about, and he told him about three other four other projects. And my father was the one designing. But the whole the whole letter describes the tension and the relationship with the other two architects. So all these four architects are well known now, but they were working together with different relationships and different trajectories after. So all this now all of a sudden is available and people from these other uh, you know, libraries and magazines, they're basically telling me about it. And so I'm basically asking Donato, please send me the entire letter because you send me, send me only three pages. And this becomes available to the whole world. You can say, oh, why don't you write an essay about this? Yes, I could, but it will take me a long time to be able to do it. With this, I can get this out relatively quickly and I can make the point of how this, uh, uh, this happened in ways that it gets recorded. So I'm very careful about how I write about it because I put the dates, I put the, I put the, the, the information in, in, in a very clear way so it can be used. So when I, when I write here what happened, I'm writing all the names of all the, the, the office where my father worked. Sorry, it's the other one. And I'm using this also to make a case about the importance of sketching. So for example, I decided here to put drawings together. So this one is by my father. This is by the architect that worked with my father at the time. They, they, my father then moved to Madrid. That's why I grew up in Madrid because eventually my father moved to Madrid, but he started his career in Barcelona. And this is another architect that draws beautifully. So I put here like how a project can be developed with sketches. And in this case, he's also using, the common theme is the circle. So the circle is an excuse to show different ways of doing things or seeing things. So this is, this is by this architect. And then I put one that is mine. So I put a project that I did that I all of a sudden it makes me realize this is a project that I did when I was 19 years old in my first architectural studio. And then I look at it and I say, wow, you know, I could, I could sign it today, you know, in terms of the, the, the sketching, the drawing. So I say, okay, maybe there was an influence 
from the point of view of how sketching was very inherently part of my way of thinking early on. And it maybe was influenced by my father and by Emilio Donato, but these are all drawings from that first studio, architecture studio that I did when I was 19. And I put it out there. It's a great way for me to pay homage to the professors that I had. So I write here the story about this was a course that I took with Luis Fernandez Galeano. He was ecstatic when I told him this summer. I had everything. I had 20 pages of these sketches. I couldn't believe it. I have them. I mean, this is my first architecture studio, and I had 20 pages of this. This I just selected three or four. So it's giving me an excuse to revisit things from the past, connected with things from the present, but it's evolving in terms of ancient cultures, Michael. When you say I was not going to talk about ancient cultures. Of pre 19 uh, no. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's ancient. That's ancient, you know. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm looking at other, other things that are related to comparison. For example, look at this. I mean, I, and I've written about this in other ev uh, venues, but uh, this is part of the analysis of Teotihuacan. For example, I'm fascinated how iconography tells stories about how people think. So I look at iconography early on. For example, you look at this, uh, the tapito, the creation. This is from the 12th century in Spain, 11th century. It's considered one of the oldest tapestries of, in the world, really, because it's hard to, to, to preserve something like this. And it's I'm very interested in of how people arrange their understanding of the world. So here's, for example, the Christian understanding of the world and the creation. It's called the, the, the tapestry of the creation. And look how amazing it is in terms of they put God in the middle, and this is about the... the, the uh, Spiritu Santo, the, 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 the Spirit of, of God here. And I, I'm not going to get into all the details, but I, I like the comparison. So when you look at this, you can get into the detail of, for example, how all these, all these animals are you know, perfectly drawn at that scale because they, he was creating the, the animals and the world. And then you compare this with the Aztec way of understanding the world. They put the sun god in the middle, and they put, just like the Christian arrangement, all the things that are important to them happening around. And this forces you to look at this very carefully because I need to do a lot of research to write exactly what is that we're seeing here in terms of the way they understood the passage of time, the sun, the deities, the days, the, all the things that are very much relevant to, to uh, a worldview that is very different, but at the end, very common. This is from uh, Bosch, uh, how he arranged the seven capital uh, scenes. And, and when, it, when it goes to the comparison, I want to jump to this one here, for example. Look at these three images. These are, this is a Christian image. This is a, a Jain from India, and this is from Teotihuacan. And all of a sudden, you realize that they arranged the way they understand the world. Think about this. No one, none of these knew that the world was rounded. Obviously, this was all done before anyone knew about it. But they all understood the world as something that was, in a way, created by something bigger than itself. So here we have the image of the, the architect is never represented in better terms than with God the creator. The, is, this is basically an image that is God the architect of the world, right? From the, from the Middle Ages with a compass, literally is creating the world. So you see God holding the world in his hands, in his hands. And there's a very detailed description of how and where this happened. So it's not, I like the image by itself, but I like the effort that has to be put in understanding what you're seeing. This Bible was, was, has been preserved in the Toledo Library, the Cathedral of uh, the Toledo uh, Cathedral since for 800 years. And it's a beautiful book. I documented you know, all the aspects, but I take this image in a way that I can compare with other images that are representing the, the same thing in other cultures. So think about, for example, this one. The hands, the world is a circle, the figure in the back is, is frontal and is basically creating, protecting, generating that life. For example, this is the great goddess in Teotihuacan. What happens is that archaeologists, they look at this and say, the great goddess had a medallion in the middle. Oh, yes, yeah, sure, it looks like a medallion. And I say, no, it's not a medallion. That's Teotihuacan. And that's actually the city itself. And I'm going to do another post where the city was an ideal city that was circular. And they are only the way you understand this is by saying every culture has had a tendency to represent things in very similar ways. So I'm very interested in that ability for visual imagery to help connect ways that people, uh, uh, how people see the world. 
and, and this is, for example, another one. I don't know how many of you know about. So I, I, I like the composition. So for example, I'm going to have a series of three pre-Columbian Asian Christian image that I have of three things that are similar, and I'm going to arrange them in the same way. For example, this one is arranged also this way. What you can see here, and I'm coming to an end because I know that we need to talk a little bit, but this one here is on top of this, and it's, it's a fascinating. I don't know how many of you know of Hilder, Hildegard von Bingen. Is, a, is this nun from Germany of the 12th century that it was, he, she created this amazing music. If you haven't heard the music, you know, I'm talking about medieval music that is really hauntingly beautiful. And, and she, was, she had these visions. So she claimed that she had visions since she was very young and she represented the visions that helped her understand the world. And this is her understanding of microcosm and, mo, uh, uh, and uh, macro and mi microcosm with Adam in the middle. And this is the spirit of the universe. And she's here having the vision. And this is, this is again, very kind of detailed documentation. It was done in the 12th century. And it was, uh, it was reproduced from book to book with better quality or less quality. But it's a very interesting way of seeing the world. And this is, this is Michael, what gets interesting. For example, this is a response that I got about this, this particular image. So I write and explain. I need to spend a lot of time. And, uh, some I, one thing that is interesting, I only work on this at night or on the weekends. I don't work at, at all during the day on this. I work only at night or on the weekends. So I can spend at night an hour, two hours learning about Hildegard, and I'm perfectly happy. So I, I like that kind of sense of being able to do it a little bit as a, as a, as a hobby. But uh, for example, this one, someone saw it, and I didn't know who he was, but. He wrote this, I enjoyed this greatly. The relationship between macrocosm and mic microcosm is, though I'm not Christian, a perfectly reasonable interpretation of the human condition. I see in the openness of Adam's arms the symbolic manifestation of a wound, an unfolding of the circle as its center and inverting. So all of a sudden, this person is getting very, and yeah. it turns out that it's a philosophy, graduate, graduate student of philosophy at Yale, and you know, saw this, and all of a sudden he's reacting. I need to spend some time to be able to answer because I need to read three times, you know, his, his answer to be able to keep the dialogue going. But it's, it's all of a sudden opening this kind of relationship. But look at how I arranged this one. Just the last thing that I say. This is the mistake I made. I wanted to frame this image of God in the middle. I like the notion of the frontal image with the flanking images because I'm, the way I have it in Google, in Google Photos is reverse. I wanted to have the angel, angel to the left and this one to the right. So this is a, an American artist that died of AIDS, very young, and this is Frangelico. And I like the contrast. This is a trash can. This is gold. This is the angel looking this way. This is someone shooting something, you know, that is very much connected to the relationships that she interprets that the world is made of. So I wanted, I, I like the idea of playing with the composition of the images, but themes that may not be necessarily related. I like the juxtaposition of those kind of things. So this is where I'm going. I don't know where it's going. I'm enjoying it. I like it. It gives me an avenue to try many different things and put some of my projects, put up some of my ideas. And is it a waste of time? Well, I have a quick question. Before, <laughs> you, is any of your... Yeah, I'm done. I'm done. So okay. we can start questions. Okay. <laughs> So uh, is this is this is your Instagram feed? Yeah. It's not like there's another section with. No, that's it. Work or something. No. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, no. Well, what, what is that? What is the question? The firms. Oh no no no. There's a, there's a, there's an Instagram for my firm, yeah, yeah. but I'm not involved with it. Oh, okay. So there's an Instagram with my firm. Yes, okay. work. Yeah. This is purely purely personal. Yes. Okay. I have several questions, but I'll ask you them later because we'll take too much time. The first one is. The we can go on after one o'clock, by the way. Okay. Okay. I have a, so at the very beginning of your presentation, you're talking about research institutions and what research is. And you kind of talked about, you said the stated goals of a research institution are to share information, discover new information, and offer new ideas. Is that generally the case? Yeah. And so then from my experience at UC, so I'm a second year math with sustainable design school. And fortunately, there's no studio for sustainable design school. But if you say that UT is a research institution, I find it hard to believe that if the studios seem to make it more meaningful to trade school to prepare you to work in the architectural front of the industry rather than discover and propose new ideas. Even though new ideas are inherently proposed in all architecture, mm -hmm. I don't think there's a discovery of not what you're better than 
to you how you get to a firm. And I feel that leans far more to the faithful rather than the people. Well, yeah, that's, that's a, I mean, I think that the idea is that you, you, you should be able to do both. I mean, in a way, an institution is preparing people, you know, when I say sharing, the, the, basically the, ba the basis of how we learn is that someone that supposedly knows more than you shares that knowledge with you. And you prepare yourself and this apprentice concept, right? You, you want to be a painter, you go to a, stu a painter's studio and you learn from... So the, the institution is preparing people to be able to follow different fields of, uh, of uh, professional life. You can do that and create new knowledge at the same time. I don't think why you, th you think that it cannot, be ha it cannot happen at the same time. Maybe your personal experience right now is making you feel like it's not happening. Yeah, but it is absolutely possible that a lot of the, a lot of the ideas that I mean, you know, if you mind like you promote certain ideas, then the people that go to those architectural offices are trained in a way that they can start having an impact in those firms. There you go. You can have all the time new ways to think about things. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Can I add something to that? Yeah. Just answer to your question. Uh, there is a colleague in Montreal, at the University of Montreal, uh, Jean Pierre Chopin. Mm -hmm. He has a lab called LEAP, Laboratoire Experimental d'Architecture Potential, so experimental mm -hmm. lab of potential architecture. What he does is he documents and systematizes all the competition entries submitted in Canada. Mm -hmm. He has an arrangement with the Canadian government, mm -hmm. not only the winners that we published on the magazine, mm -hmm. all the entries. And his uh, hypothesis is that we produce a lot of knowledge in studio, for instance, every semester. Mm -hmm. We put them up for 40 minutes mm -hmm. and we throw them away. Uh, that's Jean Pierre's hypothesis. So, for the competitions in Canada, they document, store, and systematize everything so that you can go back and you can find a competition entry from 1992. It's their store. Yeah, no, no. To use as a knowledge base. I mean, this is one of the things that the media, uh, I mean, and I'm talking about the internet, has created the ability to access information. I couldn't do what I'm doing here if there was no digital photos. You know, this in mind, you had to take a picture, you had to, you know, it would be almost impossible. So you have an ability now to share, for example, a catalog of all the competitions of one country with very easy access. So what do you do with that? That's the key. How do you? But I'm very much in favor of having the ability to access information. And I love the fact that we are having this conversation. Mm -hmm. I think uh, universities are many, many decades behind on that conversation. We still, uh, we need to follow peer review process and uh, academic presses that are, uh, uh, have a, a reputation in the field, et cetera, et cetera. But you have the ability to reach millions of people while we know that the readership of the articles that we write on peer review journals is in the dozens. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think, I, I, think I mean, it, it, it yeah, campus, yeah, yeah. Campus and student campus. Yeah. Hi, um, I, I know that you are not going to use it for commercial purposes, but for us, we have posting many things you like on Instagram. Have you found anyone or any clients just look after you or ask you questions? And how do you view with this situation? Have you ever dealt with the clients that are attracted by you or well, yeah, no, I have, I have, I have many clients that follow it, and I, and there, and there are clients that uh, uh, are intellectually curious. There are others that are not. So there are many that are very uh, uh, interested in seeing what you're thinking, and they like to learn about what you're. So I see this as a kind of parallel thing that I don't, I don't tell people because I want them to, 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 to. To look at it, I just they discover it. That's the thing that I find I'm fascinated that people discover this how without. Do they, how do they discover it? This is what everybody tells me. Yeah, because there, you know, I don't know the, the the algorithms that allow for people to be connected because they are there are themes that are you know. Yeah, you may know well, how yeah. how people know. I mean, I told. It's perfect to have the hashtags too. The hashtags is one thing that I learned how to do. So I follow this, but 
but and I don't even know you, but it's just because. <laughs> <laughs> really? So you, so, so how do you? It's suggested because somebody else I know follows it and follow it's suggested. <laughs> <laughs> So, so this is to me what is interesting about this in a way, but so the, the, no one has necessarily said, hey, I saw your Instagram account and, and, and I didn't know about you. In this case, I have clients that have become uh, followers of the of in full circle just on their own with, 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 without me telling them about it. And, and then they would make a comment or sometimes they didn't even say, they don't even say anything. Sometimes they may write something in the comment section, but it is, uh, I see it as a very independent uh, world, you know, and some clients love to know about what you have in your head. Some clients they couldn't care less. So, so how many hours a week do you post? On Instagram? Well, some of these can take a, a while. I mean, I have been able to post at the same pace as the, I was doing before, and I have a lot of ideas of what I want to do next. But I, it takes me a while. I mean, it takes some of these can take several hours. You know, no, 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 just one post. You know, so it can take several hours. So it depends. If I have to, I mean, it used to be that I was able to post a little more often. Now I'm not able to post as often. So, for example, this week I wanted to post one about cities yeah. that I have ready that is about ideal cities. And I couldn't, I, I just didn't find that I was going to have enough time to post the three of them. Because I like to, I like to post one, two, three, and then keep them. Because when you push another, when you push, if you post another one, Michael, it gets all out of sequence, right? Because, you know, you, you get... Yeah, so you know, I like the idea is that two days, two days, two days, and then you can you can take a break, and then yes, yeah. Um, about your writing, I'm curious about like to what, to what extent do you, like exterior situations or events influence the topic that you write about versus your own kind of infatuation or passion in a particular subject despite its relevance. Well, I'm trying to connect them. So, for example, this one on Baltimore. I published it, I post this one the day that Donald Trump made those tweets uh, about Baltimore being a, a rat hole and, you know, all this. So it was very interesting how people responded. You know, I, this, I took this picture in Baltimore and I, I just want to show something different that was very relevant to the moment. So I posted this the same day that, uh, that well, the day after or something. So, but it just happened to be that I had that. So it's not necessarily easy, but I was, I'm trying to connect it. Kevin. Okay. I love yeah. you doing this, and I actually love the optimism of it all. Like, um, there are, I mean, there, I have some friends doing this too. Like Paul Shepard is, uh -huh. like, has these kind of blogs. Like, really interesting thing, and, and, and like I said, I love that you're you're kind of pursuing this interest and seeing where it goes. How do you address the kind of, I mean, the, the critique of this kind of social media is uh, it just treats everything like superficial, mm -hmm. you know, and and you know the dilemma for architects is mm -hmm. like uh, clients now are just seeing like the world in a Pinterest world of like. I like this and I like that, and yep. any mm -hmm. circle is the same. Like, how do you address that? Well, I, I think it's more with self-imposed. Um, the, the way I'm, I, I'm aware of that, and I'm trying to, and I know that a lot of people that look at this don't read necessarily what I write. I don't know how many of you that are here. Do you read? Do you read it or not? Do you read it? No. So, 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 <laughs> my son is very funny. My son says. This week I'm gonna read it. <laughs> so, you know, the, if I don't read it. So, but but and it's, and I thought and I know it's long. So basically, Kevin, to to my self-imposed way to think about it is that what I write, I want to write it with the kind of rigor that if it's by itself somewhere, it's almost like if you were imagining this in the pages of a book, you will have that type of you know uh, expectation. So, but I'm aware that it could be exactly what, what, what's your name? Jill. Jill. What Jill is saying is like, I like the image and I know that I'm no, I'm very aware that the, the Instagram operates in that instant way, but I know that the people read it because people respond to what I'm saying. For example, I published this one here that is about a beautiful piece that is in the, it's very simple, right? But for example, Nancy Holt, this uh, artist, you know, is land art artist, very famous, you know, you know, people that know, but not, not quite as famous as, as her first husband that died in, in, in a plane crash. And so, for example, when I write in this here, you know, the people start telling me, I didn't know she was married to Robert Smithson because I spend the time saying she was married to Robert Smithson. Robert Smithson is much more famous for whatever reason. They did a lot of things together. So I'm using this to promote certain things that I feel like are a little unfair and I just do it and explain, but there's an explanation here that those 
that when Jill has time, like my son next week, you know, she, you read it, there is a rigor here that my assumption is that people should learn something the way I learned something when I put this up. So anyone that cares to read it, they can learn something. If they don't read it. Thank you very much. Um, we do go on for another 10 or 15 minutes, so feel free to stick around. <laughs> yeah. If not, take your boxes with you. Oh, thank you. It's wonderful. <laughs> So, I have no idea you are doing this. Yeah, no, I need to. I need to. The fact that the Instagram is a square format. Yeah, it's, 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 it's because it's like Louis Kahn. Yeah, no, and, and when you see them all together, what happened is that people, that's what Rosa told me, you need to start an Instagram account. He said, why? He's like, because look at look at the way I have them. Is intrinsically Instagrammable? And, and you, should, you should do uh, Louis Kahn's account. Do what? Yeah, yeah, and I would like to do Exeter and... So, but for example, what? I did have a lot of Blow me away. I've really? no, never no. seen Instagram <laughs> at this level before. Well, it's, it's what I'm saying. Each one is right. at this level. Okay. I don't, yeah. Like most well, of these on Instagram, like. Yeah, like. Well, you look at the picture, you like it. Over. My kids are like, love, like, likes, likes. Yeah. Like, they don't read unless yeah. their kids but, but, you know, post on it. Yeah, but so, I have a so question it, about, yeah. um, yeah. you know, there are alt metrics. Mm -hmm. You know, for faculty that are trying to get tenure, and yeah. they they go they use these alt metrics. Well, they use metrics. Yeah, but yeah, they've is. had alt metrics for a while now, and even just researching uh, social media. How do you feel about you know universities are very slow in that uptake about using these as um, social media? Oh, I think that as influence. It's, it's it's just a matter of time that they're yeah. they're going to start using it because I mean I think that. Especially think about like what's happening now, and you know, I you know in that article that I was talking about, how the universities at some point were the kind of source of ideas, and they could, right. they could be. Yeah. And all of a sudden now, Donald Trump can do a tweet, and right. it can have you know an impact that if we don't if we don't start kind of competing at the yes. way ideas are spread, the universities are going to become irrelevant. Well, since if you didn't have tenure. You are now. Well, right. That's well, what yeah. I. Would you that be was doing going this? to be my this question. Is, this is a very good point. Absolutely, I'm doing this with no sense of obligation yeah. of right. any kind. Right. So, but I, that's what I'm saying. That I'm doing it at night on the weekends. No, but but this. No, but this even, is if a really did it, even if you did it in office time, who cares? No, 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 but what I'm trying to say is that you're totally right. If you're an assistant professor, someone's going to say, don't waste your time doing this because you're going to go into something that is not going to be. Actually, years ago, years ago, there was a faculty member I was talking about alt metrics with, and um, they were they want, they were up for tenure, and they produced this article that went, went wildfire once it got picked up by. But in order to show that impact, you have to use alt metrics. The metrics, yeah. And... Um, you know, now, you know, since that years ago time, now we have yeah, like the Russians with, with, and you're going to do, you're going to do post tenure review at some point, right? Every six years. Yeah, 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 we have to. Yeah, but now. So this, this is going to be in there, right? Yeah. But we have now have a new so layer of, your of Russian go, influencers. Well, no, I mean, I, mean, I, I think this I, is the pleasure of being a full professor. Like, I think this <laughs> yeah. is awesome, but I don't think, but I think there's a great disjunction between getting credit for it. No, like, no, I, mean, I don't and, and, know. I think. I mean, I think you're right. I mean, people people may choose show. may choose not to, but no, I'm but saying. But, but 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 Michael, you know, this is a little bit like. Okay, right. thank you, okay, thank you Kevin. Thank you for coming. Yeah, so, pleasure. I'm, I'm super pleased that you're doing this. I mean, okay, well, I think, it's, <laughs> I think it's awesome. It is. It's certainly so much better than you greatly overestimated. I think the number of people that read peer-reviewed journals, like dozens. Yeah. Oh no. Dozens, yeah. No. Dozens. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think, you know. Yeah, it might reach two digits. No, yeah. no, it's true. I mean, it's it's the reality. But the yeah. alt so metrics awesome. show the impact of the research. Yeah. They actually they do um, count. The citations. No, yeah. the cite, it's, it's, all that proves is that someone clicked on you. No, that, it doesn't. They're you can, just as shallow. No, you can follow the. You can follow how it gets it with um, big data and following big data. Yeah. It shows influences. Yeah. And you can go from. You can actually start connecting from point A. To point B with new research, right? Because that's yeah, what but research that is. research yeah. would be just as superficial. No, not necessarily. The, 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 the well, I mean, but Michael, at some point, man. I said, yeah, but the problem is that you, you, if you yeah, want to quantify to everything, through. it's very hard. But if you can start saying, you know, to me, the influence is how do you start taking certain thinking in one direction or another? And I'm using, I'm going back to that article. Universities as a whole decided that it was a good thing to promote certain ideas during the, that period. 
and they were very effective. They affected immigration laws. And so what I'm saying is that what do universities think that is important, how we can help to promote certain ideas? Any avenue is good. A research paper is good. An op-ed in a newspaper is good. And Instagram could be good. It's just a lot more to sift through. Yes. And now you have the muddy waters of influences like, you know, Russian. Oh, yeah. You know, Absolutely. All that. It's a really interesting topic right yeah. now. Yeah. So that's yeah. why I, I just wanted to say, hey, this is my perspective. I, I'm not an well, expert. I, I think it's wonderful that you've gone out of the boundary of architecture into politics yes. and all that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It made my head hurt because yeah, I was thinking, how is somebody going to archive your... Everything is politics. Yeah, everything is politics. <laughs> he said right. that last. Yeah. Thank you. This was really Thank lucky. you, Matthew. It's definitely politics. Yeah. <laughs> well, I just wanted to say it's wonderful. And I, I like parallel lines and lamps. Parallel lines and lamps. I have tons lamps. of photographs uh -huh. with that combination. So maybe well, I will start are you so, so are you in, on Instagram? Uh, no, I'm not. I okay. don't. I haven't because I don't have enough time, and I know right now I don't have time. Yeah, yeah, that's so, right. But I will. And in my so case, in my exciting. case, is is what I was thinking is like no way in the world I could have thought about this. I would not have started this if I didn't have the sabbatical. Probably I would not have started if I was an assistant professor because you have all the priorities. So in my case, it's like I felt like it was a tangible way to feel like I could. I will always remember that I started this because they, there was a little bit of that so, extra. But it's wonderful it's connected to your dad, which I love that personal dimension to it. But now I'm going to look at your work differently. I'm going to be looking for circles and squares in your work. Do you yeah, know? and I put some, for Does example, I did. Does Rivera buildings now look like this? No, and this is, I'm very good at not forcing things. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I'm not, I mean, I'm, I don't like to force things. So in a way, I think that, for example, there are three, this is, this is a circle, this is a spiral. I didn't show these. This is a spiral of a building that we finished in Mexico. This is a, a skylight. Uh, sorry, this is this I show already. So every now and then I show my own uh, my own work. This is, for example, another project that I did in school. This is about spheres, and and so this is this is for example from a student. So this is a vertical student studio, sorry studio student that I took a picture when I was doing the review, and I thought it was very interesting, mm -hmm. and you know I like the idea, and for example this is great island cities. Yeah. The island cities. I did an island city. This is the, the island city that I did. So, but it's all connected to the idea that you have, uh, I, like, I like that to put the, my own work in the context by forcing me to all the time put it adjacent to other things. Instead of trying to hide it, I'm trying to be as open about how all these things are connected. Basically, I'm, I'm a believer that everything is much more connected than we try. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, in this obsession that we have now with labels and everything is different. You are this, you are that, you are that, you are, you are, you are like Michael would say, you are Greek Cyprus, you are Turkish Cyprus, right? So there's an obsession. Everything we can fracture. We can divide more and more in Spain, now Catalonia. Yes. Oh, I'm Catalan, I'm not Spanish. Identity politics. Yeah, it's horrible. I mean, it's horrible that everything seems to be seen only through that first label. And so what I'm trying to do here is something different. This is so fascinating. Mm -hmm. I mean, amazing. Thank you very much. Because for me personally, you see that I have so many um, roles I have played. I, I'm an architect, I'm an endologist, I'm a linguist, I'm studying preservation here. I love photography. So for me, this love is beginning. Everything. Maps. Look at look at these maps. Look at look at this map. So I wish I had time. Michael, you are the kind of person that I can spend like easily ten hours telling you about this thing because I know that you will be very interested. Look at this map. I mean, you look at this map. Which one are we looking at? Look yeah. this three. I put I put it on purpose. These are maps. And now I'm trying to finish. I got your. That is a wonderful uh, thing. <laughs> I'm trying so, to connect, tie all the bits together. I mean, uh, I you have your whole life. Yeah, oh. well, I, so what program are you in? Uh, I'm doing a PhD in architecture. Okay. Uh, historic preservation as a focus with technology as something I'm looking at. And that's why when you when this was social media, so if you let me see what's happening here. Well, I mean, uh, preservation is, is a, a topic that also touches so many things. Oh, but, yeah. But uh, the, these the maps context. that I'm saying, for example, I'm fascinated with maps. I have always loved maps. Me too. <laughs> and so, for example, I say maps. This is a map in Spain. I go to this, and this is what is great. I mean, you become like a curious person. I tell this to students. If you're not a curious person, what are you doing in architecture? <laughs> you, yeah. know, you have to be curious. <laughs> so this is, and, and what I said that in the, in the story. Look, look at this map. This map. 
this is done in, in, in Spain, Spain based on a friar in Spain from the 8th century. Mm -hmm. So 1776. Imagine the understanding of the world. And so this is preserved in the Cathedral of Burgo de Osma. It's a town that you go there now, you cannot believe it. it has the second largest collection of manuscripts after the Paris Library. <laughs> you know, it's just hard to believe. And, this, this, and then what I do is I show the book. This is where it was drawn. And this is the kind of beautiful drawings that are part of that Bible. But then I show details. So what, you, what, you, what I like about this is that it's forcing me to... I, I went there personally and I saw this in the cathedral. But when you need to write about it, you increase the level of demand that you put on yourself to really explain it. Look at this the explanation. No wonder Jill doesn't yeah, read it. Did you find that, <laughs> so, did you find that on Wikipedia? No? Yes. No, and I have books. For example, yeah, this, I, I bought the catalog of the books. You can't just do Wikipedia. And, 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 I read, <laughs> and I read about it, but look at... Look You're doing at, your own personal Wikipedia. Like the Wikipedia of circles. Well, in a way. In yeah. a way, it's true that it's, I'm, I'm accumulating this. But I just think that it's fascinating how people see things. I mean, and this is, I forgot to say for students, like when you're an architect, you need to get in someone else's head. Mm -hmm. You need to understand what your clients are thinking. So for me, it's fascinating to think what the friar that drew this was thinking mm -hmm. when he drew this map. I mean, they didn't know that the world was circular, but why they tend to think about this this way? These are all the 12 up, up, um, apostles, like where they want to preach. Jerusalem is in the middle. This is Europe. This is Africa. This is Asia. And this is the best. This is the unknown lands that are inhabited by these monsters that have know. only one leg that they use to protect themselves from the sun. Hmm. So when, so <laughs> this, and, and this is this is apparently a very yeah. I've never heard that before. But yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I know, but when you read more about it, and this is what I was saying this about, you read more about it, and the good thing is that they're very. I mean, people like to, you know, dismiss the internet as like a lot of trash, but you have very you know, PDFs of very good essays and books that talk about this. This was a very typical way in the Middle Ages to represent the unknown. And there was these monsters that had this leg that was so big that they used it as an umbrella. And when you think about it, who came up with that? <laughs> and then Have you, you, do you know anything about the myth of Yggdrasil? The myth of what? Yggdrasil. Ah, uh, it's, it's a Norse. It's a Norse. Okay, from, from the, from the, the Vikings. Vikings. It's a picture of a tree. Uh -huh. The tree has a root. Yeah. The roots go to a circular island uh -huh. surrounded by ocean. Uh -huh. And it's all in a circle. Uh -huh. so it would be one of your circles for sure. I would like to it's find the right called, one. It's called the world tree. And it's Yggdrasil, Y-G-G. If you just type in Y-G-G, you'll get there. Y-G-G. Yggdrasil. But for example. Yeah. But it's a very, very beautiful mythology. And it's also, just, you know, that the idea that the world is round long preceded the discovery of yeah, totally. that the world is a globe. But that's because the, if you stand out in the desert on the ocean, exactly. it's just a circle around you. Yeah, you, you perceive so, everything else. So that, that idea of, or the dome of the sky, like those two ideas are very strong. So in Yggdrasil, you see the tree, mm -hmm. the dome of the sky, mm -hmm. the island that is the earth. Mm -hmm. The unknown ocean, but it also has roots. The tree has roots, mm -hmm. and the picture shows the underground as well, which is basically the underworld, and that comes up into into reality. And that's another thing that is universal: the the notion of the of the tree of life. The Maya did it, you know. Yeah. You know I, I mean, that's why I'm I'm a little bit like kind of like the yeah. chapter zero of history, you know, not chapter one, chapter zero. You know, when when all those things. So when you look at maps. Look at this one of, of India. I mean, sorry, of uh, China. Sorry, I went the wrong way. I saw you have a Jane something. Graphic. Yeah, Jane. And, it's, and I had to learn a lot about it because yeah. I didn't have time to get into, into it because yeah. the interesting is that they don't believe in a creator. Do you know Ajit Jane? We had to, uh, no, we had to study religion for yeah. my Indology studies. So cool. we learned all the religions, basics of religions. So this is a map of China. Don't encourage, look, look at how, that, how and you, you understand how China has always thought of themselves as the center of the world. So this is producing Korea. This is China with the, the same way that they had the apostles, you know, spread all over. These are the rivers. This is the yellow river and the wall. And so this is, this is what is fascinating. All of a sudden you look with the swipes, now that I can get a little closer, look at the yellow river. 
growing up, I always thought that Yellow River was called Yellow River because in Chinese, uh, Chinese people were referred to as the uh, yellow, yellow people. Yeah. And so I was like, no, the Yellow River, this is the Yellow River, and this is the Great Wall. And this is the moment where it crosses the yellow and then, you know, and this is the representation of uh, China. And it was used. And then you learn how, what the map was used for. And, but it's also basically saying this map is much older and they knew very well how the world was. They ignore it. The, the friars were... were did, you, did, did you like David that Chinese lecture? Well, I have the same kind of reaction as you did, you know, not maybe as extreme because I know that I, I visited that building, but it's, it felt a little... A little because he would, he would, he would get that. He would follow this if he knew. Because his references are quick. Mm -hmm. His references are imagistic. Mm -hmm. You know, like a headdress becomes mm -hmm. a building. Mm -hmm. uh, his assistants collect pictures. Right? And I was critical of that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I love that you're doing this in hobby style, but I have a feeling mm -hmm. that if I saw you offering a new building mm -hmm. based on a selection of the cross-cultural, you know, imagistic, and so my building is like this. Mm -hmm. I would probably actually not be happy. You would not be happy? No, I would not be happy. No, no, I mean, I, I mean, I mean I, it's, it's very subtle what I was saying. Like, <laughs> you cannot force things. Good, you cannot do things based on good intentions. Like, hey, this is not this. that you have to make me happy, by the way. You can do anything you like. No, no, of course, of course, my God, I, I will. <laughs> And he will. <laughs> but it is true that there are ways to connect. I think that you cannot force things. But there are ways to link ideas from one place to another. So when I look at these things, you know, I have to, I would probably take six months on every picture. Like this, like this building here with the cells going around. Oh, this is, I didn't have time to, to talk about it. Look at uh, this one. No, this is amazing. <laughs> I visited this building in Guatemala with my students. Mm -hmm. This is a convent. I spent a lot of time because I visited in person. Didn't quite believe all the things that I heard from the visit. But I had to do a lot of research. To get to the to the story of the building, look at look at how it is. Is is this is for? Oh, I'm reading it. I'm oh, you're reading. It. So no, I'm reading. The, I'm reading the building. I'm not reading it. Mm -hmm. Should I just swipe? Like, what else is there? Oh, sure. The swipes show you the courtyard. It's very hard to photograph, as you can imagine. This, those were the cells of the nuns. Yeah. Did you get into a room? Why is mm -hmm. it like that? Well, I do. There were no you can issue. See for, inside. But look at the section. Yeah. This is space underneath. It was Water. magical space. It was yeah. used as a sister. Yeah. But the interesting, the architect who did it was the architect in charge of the water system for the entire town, Antigua. Mm -hmm. This is Antigua, Guatemala. This is a city that is fascinating. I don't know mm -hmm. if you've been there, Michael. It's fascinating. It's a city that was the capital city, and there were so many volcanoes and earthquakes that they abandoned the city as the capital. So they built a little bit like like Fatehpur Secret in, in in India. They they built the capital all there for, and it's like, oh my God! So we need to go. You know, we need to move somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So it kind of got frozen in time. But this architect was the one that that did. So it's it's basically a historic city without all the ugliness of the industrial that you know parts that come always always around any city. Mm -hmm. So. He designed this, and then my, my, my explanation is that he did it round because water flows better when things are round. You know, you know it doesn't flow very well with the corner. So he was collecting all the water here. These nuns have running water and, and little latrines, and then the water was also collected here. So the water was collected here. So there was there was water here to provide you know water for the whole comet, and then the rooms are arranged around, and then. Here it has a gigantic column in the middle, and the space underneath is a gigantic, beautiful circle with a gigantic column. I remember when I went down with my students, mm -hmm. one student started singing. Oh, wow. and, and, I, you know, and everybody got quiet and it started to some join her. She was a very good singer, so I didn't oh. join <laughs> But and it was the space was so beautiful and so magical, the kind of sense of like how is it lit just because 
No, no, no. Right. So the, the only the only light was coming from the stair that takes you down. Is there a slope to that water connection so that the water just flows? I've got to go to the studio. I teach vertical studio. Me too. I teach. I have studio. I want. I want to. <laughs> <laughs> If I can ask a very quick question, you sort of alluded to it through the presentation, but um, do you see this more as for yourself as a real kind of interrogation kind of research database that you have a chance to hold on to, or is it really more for kind of spreading the information? Or is it equal parts? I think it's equal parts. I mean, I think in a way, I, 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 I like. I'm curious, I like to learn, I enjoy learning these things, but I like the idea that all the people can, right. instead of, you know, you can do this and you can say, I learn it, I have it, I have it in my folder or my binder in my in my office. Yeah. I like the idea that it can be shared so quickly. Right. So I do it for both, but I think that my sense is that long term, when there's enough accumulated, this can be presented in different ways. You can do a book mm -hmm. where you can start organizing themes around so you can imagine like how easy it would be to have like one page is the image and then the page on the, on the left can be text swipes absolutely all the all the information and then you can organize it by themes mm -hmm. i like i like how you can learn to see things by just looking one thing and then you look at another one what what a second this yeah. Yeah. this is the same same thing as we were just seeing and so that's something that long term i think mm -hmm. i'm going to keep doing it and then at some point maybe it can become something else in terms of like it can be Present it as a book where you, yeah. you make a selection. Absolutely. I was going to say it's it's really refreshing seeing a platform that we associate very much with wasting of time and you know and envy. You know you look at social media of other people and you're sitting there jealous or they're on vacation, but really treating the platform as something that can be representative of the research you're doing, the things you're interested in, and actually writing. And I think it's it's really impressive how you can within an hour or two, write something up. That's what I struggle with. And mm -hmm. Because of his previous, uh, yeah. Right, well, it's like, I think this is... Sometimes it takes me much more. <laughs> yeah, that's what I struggle with. It's like, I mean, do you do you write it as you're sitting there on your phone? No, 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 no. I, 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 cannot, I, I cannot even text. I mean, my, my family, they do WhatsApp. I say, okay, I need yeah, to go yeah. through email because I cannot... See, I mean, it's so... Those sorts no, no, of I do like it I all have, in the computer. Yeah. And then I, I cut and paste. Yeah. And then I put it on. That's on. some brilliant strategy because I like I have photographs of research that I've done for, oh, yeah. Yeah. you know, that's travel, amazing. and that travel was never really showcased anywhere. Instagram seems like a good platform, but then you put yourself under so much pressure to actually write and write correctly. Yeah, and that's information that is good and not just you know because you're not having it read by anyone and approved, you are essentially controlling the sources. Yeah. And you have to be honest, not to yourself, but also to the people that are reading this information that it's true and it's been, you know, checked in some way. That should be a policy always. Yeah. yeah the, the Even if you're not being read. The concern is to make sure that doesn't become, <laughs> that doesn't become a, a burden. I mean, you know, in a way, right. in a, in a way, you need to make sure that it becomes something enjoyable. Yeah. But of That's course, of course, you have a sense of obligation. For example, some, sometimes when I have in mind to post something this weekend, I'm so busy and I cannot do it. And you know, you feel disappointed because you know, you have that, obviously, you don't publish, who cares? You have all the pressing things <laughs> you need to do. I mean, at right. home in my like, you know, have still a daughter in school, you know, yeah. so super busy. So it is a little bit of that sense of doing it a little bit as a extra thing that you care about, but it's not necessarily. Doing it for yourself, but also as a pet project. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's important right now because so many people are accessing information online. Mm -hmm. I mean, most of the young people for sure. Oh, absolutely. And, and there's a lot of noise. I think that's the hard part. Sure, yeah, Michael, it's interesting when she said, Jill said, no, I don't read it. Did you read some of the things? I've only recently started following, so I haven't really had a chance to sort through it. Mm -hmm. I And I also didn't realize, I think one of the honest reactions to not reading is not because we don't want to read, but we, you don't even know. When you open up exactly. the platform, you could see it on your screen when you did it as well. You first see the hashtag descriptions. You don't even see that there's text right away. Mm -hmm. And so that's where the challenge of the platform is. It's not catered for research right away or for long explanations. Yeah, I think the maximum, there's a maximum number of characters that you can have. I think it's around 300 pages. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, there's a limit. Okay. You, you cannot put... Michael. 
when you see yeah. the images, there's no title for people yeah. to think that maybe we would get more information. I think, I think yeah. yes, I think there's a moment where it says more and you have to click that yeah. mm. to see it, right? Well, anyway, because of how we use the platform and how it's mm. your, what your expectations are right away. You just want images. You, you don't even, right. Yeah. But like your even description of how you've specifically laid out the images, for example, the image of Adam and the two circles with figures looking in opposite directions. That is brilliant because you are now actually a curator. You're not mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. dumping information. No, no, it's very curated. Yeah. As I said, it caught me off guard because <laughs> yeah. it was supposed to be the angel and the other one looking this way, but because yeah. I put it reverse. That's brilliant. But it, it just, actually, yeah. it's okay. They look the other way, so it's a little bit of a message as well. Yeah. Do you see this kind of approach starting to trickle down into maybe your own personal, uh, not personal, your work Instagram account where the firm starts to take on some of these similar ideas of like how, because your practice is very research based, it has influences and other things to kind of show that flow in a way. I know you, you said you're not involved in it. No, I'm not involved. I'm perhaps I'm that's I'm something I'm that I'm can I'm be. But I have to say that I, I gave a lecture yeah. Uh, uh, once and someone from the audience said do you write the text on your um, Instagram on my firm I said no it's an architect that is very good at writing mm -hmm. and basically he was praising how good the texts were mm -hmm. and I said well I'm going to tell him because it's interesting <laughs> and someone else said yes I read them too and they're so yeah. Bud writes very well so I trust him a lot. So we, do, we, we don't get involved, my partner and I. So he puts whatever he thinks it needs to be put and whatever mm -hmm. and whenever and whatever order. And so we, we trust him completely. So he's, uh, he's been doing a great job and, and I think he likes it. He understands yeah. it. Yeah. But apparently people like what he writes. So, but it's not, it's descriptions. It's that, but it, it takes a little more like the, the Instagram kind of approach of the images primary what mm -hmm. he's doing is that he's documenting things in groups so he's, he's, mm -hmm. he's what he told us is that he has he thinks of nine in there somewhere that i think of threes mm -hmm. he thinks yeah. of nines okay with a with a friday thing so so he has a structure where he he puts a project it's a lot of work yeah it's a lot of work it's, yeah, it's, it's a fun lot of work. too yeah. it is yeah. <laughs> well thank you once again